Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse. I'm Stephanie. We are again um, without Michelle. Hi Michelle. But I do have Jimmy sitting in with me today. Um, and we've invited Professor Louise Darsons um, to join us today for our podcast because Louise is a specialist on medievalism and there's this little show at the moment called Game of Thrones that seems to be everywhere. So Louise is the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Medievalism as well as the author of Comic Medievalism and she is writing an upcoming book called World Medievalism. So Louise, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, so medievalism, what is medievalism and why does it interest you specifically? Okay, so broadly conceived, um, medievalism is the practice of, I think, kind of reconceptualising, adapting, um, revisiting the Middle Ages in a way, I think, that allows people not just to think about the past but also to kind of reflect on the present. So it's a kind of a creative historical practice mm -hmm that um, takes the Middle Ages as its focus but is kind of highly sort of flexible in the way it interprets that past mm. and very often geared toward the present. And I think that in answer to your second question, one of the reasons why I think, you know, it is, it's had such traction as a discourse, which it has, and as a set of practices across hundreds of years now, really, mm. since the Middle Ages ended, or some people would argue there were actually medievalisms in the late Middle Ages yeah. toward earlier periods. One it's a very of the, long period. It's a it? very long period. We're always yeah. talking long periods when we get to this sort of stuff. The reason why I think um, it has had such traction over such a long time is because it's such um, a powerful mechanism or such a kind of fruitful mechanism for thinking about the present. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my sense with medievalism is that it speaks as much about the moment in which it's being produced as it does about the Middle Ages. So why yeah. specifically the Middle Ages? Why is that the kind of era that, that tends to kind of haunt us so much as it does? Yeah, another great question. I think um, there are other periods that have had a lot of appeal to the contemporary mm. moment as well. You know, the Victorian period is one that continues to kind of grip people the Renaissance as well. Uh, I mean, the Western Renaissance. Um, I guess the Middle Ages... I think it has, there are several different reasons for its appeal to the present. I think one is that it is a kind of a huge period. As you say, we're talking about very, very long period. Yeah. Um, certainly for us as historians, we're sort of talking roughly 5th to 15th century if we use a kind of conventional uh, period, periodization. Um, I think we're also looking at, again, in terms of, even if we're just thinking about it in terms of, say, you know, European. Uh, culture broadly conceived we're still talking about you know Ireland to Russia <laughs> and then yeah. if you know and sort of Scandinavia down to you know southern Italy and Spain etc but also I think um, and we see this with Game of Thrones a kind of um, capturing of the Mediterranean world right down to North Africa so we're really uh, you know when you're talking about spaces that large and time frames that large it just gives people enormous scope to imagine mm -hmm. into that past especially um given it's a period that you know there there's a certain amount of patchiness around record keeping or not the record keeping perhaps our kind of uh, uh, capacity to have kept those records or to have um, allowed those records to survive there's um, a sense in which a whole lot of people from the past didn't get to speak the privileged got to speak or to write and so it leaves all of this space for people to kind of imagine their way into it so I think that's one reason um, I think another reason is that it's a period that intrigues us with a sense of difference from us but also contradictorily it's often seen as a period where things that we recognize as the modern were in this kind of crucible phase as it were so if I can refer to Game of Thrones because uh, we are going to be uh, talking about <laughs> it today <laughs> you know say something like it's um depiction of the Bank of Bravos, you know, which is, you know, most people take to be kind of referring to medieval Venice, which people will sometimes say, you know, well, that's the kind of origin of the modern banking system mm -hmm. as we recognise it. So there's that kind of sense in which it's both unfamiliar but also familiar. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of its appeal. And maybe if I could just say one other thing that I think um, is the basis of its appeal is that it's a period that allows us to kind of uphold contradictions. And so we can simultaneously think of it as kind of barbaric and refined and we can think of it as both kind of tumultuous and static 
you know, it sort of allows us to hold contradictions about it. And you'll often see in the same texts um, these kinds of quite contradictory images of the Middle Ages. So it's kind of out of that kind of sense of contradiction, there's a kind of a fertile space for imagination. Mm -hmm. So I think it just captures us because it allows us in, in some respects, with its bigness. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that um, mm -hmm. I really loved about Game of Thrones, which I think uh, is actually part of medieval uh, literature as well, is that um, conflict between almost the, the old religion and the new religion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that sort of pagan religion and Christianity which is coming mm -hmm. through. Uh, and in Game of Thrones, especially in the first book, where I think you only get one supernatural event at the beginning of the book mm -hmm. and then one, I think, in the last page of the book or something. And for the entire book, you have this almost like medieval society happening mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. don't believe in magic. Um, but medieval literature does have that sort of duality uh, steep in it. You know, the supernatural does occur um, and occur in quite interesting way that bleeds quite nicely into the fantasy world. And that's sort of one of the things I love about the fantasy yeah. world. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things is that when we're looking at something like Game of Thrones or fantasy fiction, and I'm not an expert specifically in fantasy fiction, I look at other forms of medievalism, but I think you're absolutely right that mm. um, we're looking on the one hand at a kind of a modern imagination of the Middle Ages, but we're also looking at that kind of very long heritage of medieval literature. You know, epic and romance do have these uh, fantastic features in them, you know, sort of something like, you know, even if you think of probably that the most famous English um, medieval epic being something like Beowulf. And you've got, you know, the dragon and you've got Grendel and you've already got that kind of um, image of the otherworldly and the, and the fantastic in there. And so I think that people um, in appreciating medie medievalist fantasy today are kind of melding that sort of imaginative sense of the period but also a kind of sense of the literature of the period as well. So in, in thinking about why Game of Thrones is, you know, everywhere, it's just, I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's omnipresent. You yeah. can't kind of exist in today's world without hearing about a lot about Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. um, do you think those kinds of reasons that you've been talking through, that ability to kind of withstand complexity and, and um, that kind of cultural nostalgia, is that what accounts for the hugeness of, of Game of Thrones in your opinion? Oh. Or is it something else? Well, I, I mean, I suppose there are all kinds of other... Mm. There are probably sort of industry reasons that I yeah. sort of, you know, yeah, have course. little expertise in. But um, I think it captures the imagination. I mean, my sense is that I just think it's got really extraordinary world building. Mm. I mean, it does have that kind of sense of really dense texture to it. Um, it's It's got, um, you know, secular power, religious power. It's got dynastic politics, you know religious politics it's got um i think i think also a kind of a sense and this is one of the things that i think it does really interestingly is it does give you a kind of a, a broad world it takes the middle ages beyond europe i don't think it does it perfectly and there's been quite a lot of discussion about that within my discipline um about the extent to which its images say of the east um you know, are, are limited, but I think it does attempt to kind of move the Middle Ages just outside of this kind of Anglo-Celtic um, world of fantasy, the kind of Tolkien world, and, and kind of expand it. And you know, it's got extraordinary production values mm -hmm. as a as a show, and so it's got these amazing set locations, and it kind of creates, you know, a very kind of plausible past just through that kind of um, the kind of detail of its world building as well so I think that's one thing um, another thing that I think it has about it that you see actually in plenty of medievalist texts and this can also include sort of medievalist films the one I'm thinking of medievalist um, animations for children as well and the one that springs to mind for me um, is um, How to Tame Your Dragon or, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. is that they'll that's often it. have these kind of focalising characters who are within the medieval world but um I guess, have values or have a kind of an outlook that we perhaps with a certain amount of kind of vanity toward our own period regard as modern, right? Yeah. So they're kind of those characters. I mean, these are attractive characters in any kind of liter literature and film, you know, those liminal characters who kind of sit within that world but are spectators on it and perhaps some um, sceptics, you know. And so I think the Game of Thrones has a number of really appealing sceptic characters. My personal favourites are Tyrion and... <laughs> Varys, I, I just love Varys, and Varys's speech, 
in episode two, I'm go- not going to do too much spoiling sort of mm-hmm. stuff going on here <laughs> because I know that some people might be saving up uh, the latest <laughs> series to watch, you know, to binge watch. But just to say, without giving away too much, Varys gives the most fantastic speech about the role of service within a kind of a, you know, um, a sort of a political sort of inner circle. It's a fantastic, fantastic speech about, you know, not sort of accepting despotism. And um, and I think that you have these characters who are of that world but speak to us um, and our sense of rationality, scepticism, um, rather than, say, blind belief, um, adherence to hierarchy and, you know, privilege of birth, etc. cetera. And, and, and Varys is, of course, a kind of a former slave character or lowborn character. And um, so I think those characters who seem to challenge hierarchy and um, kind of channel a sense of modern values, there are other characters um, who are absolutely of that world. Mm -hmm. You know, I would even say Daenerys, even though she's this kind of, you know, warrior woman, there's that sense in which she just completely believes in the kind of her right to rule, her dynastic Mm -hmm. right. And so she's still sort of of that world. And you have actually, even aside from people like Tyrion and Varys, even some of the evil characters have fantastic moments of insight into the world they live in, like Cersei. Cersei gives some of the best speeches about the way women are treated. You know, she doesn't give them... She gives them from the point of view... She's a, she's a kind of a horrible character <laughs> in all kinds of ways. But... Some of the kind, and they're very bitter speeches, they're not rousing speeches, but they're very kind of cutting, insightful speeches into what it means to be a woman who is bartered through the dynastic Mm. system, you know. And so I think its appeal is that capacity to kind of sit um, and get between the kind of modern and the medieval and give you this kind of very rich, you know, richly drawn medieval world, but um, also kind of channel these modern values into that world. I mean, well, Cersei is a very interesting character because, I mean, yeah, you, you're right, she's very despicable. But at the same <laughs> yeah, time, you can't help but admire her. Completely. You know, yeah. she's, uh, you just, you hate her, but at the same time, you're kind of like, you know what, you get things done. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things... Bad, bad things. I know, yeah. bad things, but, but, but you know, one, yeah. of things things, I've been, yeah, one of the things I've been obsessed with lately is watching um, people's reactions to certain scenes from Game of Thrones. Mm. Uh, and one of the scenes that kind of shocked me with people's reaction uh, was when she, in the last season, when she blew up the uh, the set of, of Baylor. Yeah. Uh, people were applauding. They were like, you know, yeah, great. And other went, Cersei just um. basically <laughs> wiped out like you know half the cast there with that one, yeah. you know, and and they were cheering for her. Yeah. Um, and it was a really strange reaction because at the same time, yeah, they boo at her for other things, but then they can't help but cheer at her when she sort of gets rid of some of the characters that they also hate well, as well. At the same time as she got rid of you know Marjorie and yeah. some of the characters that we love, she also completely got rid of High Sparrow and yeah. this kind of terrible, you know, faith militant that was that was kind of um, you know taking over the city and and kind of uh, imposing this incredibly kind of brutal and, um, you know, fundamentalist religion, mm. you know. So there was a kind of sense in which, yeah, she got rid of fundal- fundamentalism in the city, mm. but she also <laughs> took out all, all her these, enemies, everybody, <laughs> everybody along with it. And I think that, yeah, there are all characters like Kyburn are really interesting mm. too because he's at one level, you know, speaking strongly against... Um, you know, faith versus, say, science. Mm. He's a scientist, but he's also, you know, putting his uh, rational powers to quite dubious ends, you know. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see the way Sam's character goes as he has begun to develop in, in the most recent series because mm. he's now beginning to seem like he's, you know, a character who is, uh, now that he's down, you know, um, in Old Town, uh, becoming a maester, Um that he is now kind of on the, the side of this kind of um, the, the force of questioning, the, yeah. the force of scepticism, pushing against you know um, established knowledges. So it'll be it's great interesting to you see should him. bring up him. Sam because uh, well, <laughs> I've actually Sam. I've, I've hated Sam uh, up until this current season. He's growing. Yeah, yeah. he's he's beginning yeah. to grow on me. I have yeah. to say because I thought I went, oh, geez, this guy is just so cowardly and it's so annoying. Uh, and then in this, in this late se- latest season, I thought I went, oh, actually, you know what? I'm beginning to like him a little bit he's more. He's a scholar. I always he liked him. He is a scholar. <laughs> he's a scholar, but I know what you mean. I and, think that and maybe it's that mirroring thing. I see him and I sort of see him with parts of myself. And I'm like, yeah, I really don't like you. Dweeb. <laughs> yeah. Not that you're a dweeb. Yeah, oh, dweeb scholar. But, but I, th- I think that's the thing is that he... Um, but again, he sits so kind of beautifully between this perception of him as now kind of rational 
quasi-modern, etc. Mm. Because he's doing this because he has actually seen something that is so much of that kind of medieval world that he's <laughs> in. He's seen the White Walkers. He's, you know, he believes in something, um, and it's in order to kind of um, prove to others that mm. that this thing they don't believe in is real. He has to kind of resort to, you know. Well, to being an antiquarian, he's going to find that knowledge. I really, I really like him. <laughs> he's a great character. Yep. I'm interested in um, the way that the show kind of mixes kind of real history mm. and and fantasy. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to some of the kind of historical um, truth, I suppose, for want of a better term, that lies yeah. behind the show and what the show does to history in the medieval period. Yeah, that's well. I, before I go on with my, uh, you know kind of very brief opinions on that. I might just mention um, the book by Caroline Larrington called mm-hmm. Winter is Coming where she's actually done a really thorough job. Um, there's always more to find because it's such a kind of incredibly capacious, expansive world. So Caroline has covered some of it, most lots of it. Mm-hmm. There's probably more people could find out. Um, look, I think that um, it's really interesting... Um, Martin himself has kind of pointed out that his practices, he's always been somebody who's read a lot of history. But um, I, I would describe his method as somebody who proceeds by kind of intriguing approximation, is, you know, the way I might put it, or, nice, or kind yeah. of a, a, an appro- approximations that, that um, give us enough of a kind of an anchor in you know, the known world, in the re- a recognisable kind of history. But um, he's been quite explicit about saying uh, that he doesn't, sort of tie himself to that so you know people will come back to him and say so what is dawn you know is now is dawn this or that and he'll say well okay you know you're right to point out that that dawn is quite a sort of a mixed space because actually i've based it on medieval wales and on moorish spain or as he calls it muslim spain and and also on palestine i'm not i'm less sure about that analogy i believe him i just haven't (laughs) explored it and so he um will sort of meld these two um, these different spaces together, um, you know, uh, characters like um, Grey Worm and the Unsullied are kind of a fusion. They kind of look a little bit like, you know, Greek hoplites. They're kind of the way they take on those sort of phalanx formations and etc. is very much kind of aesthetically reminding of that. But he's also kind of borrowing from, you know, the Egyptian mum looks, you know, it's kind of slave soldiers who became a sort of um, a military caste. And so he... I think he kind of borrows certain kinds of aesthetics and then weds them with certain political histories. I think, I mean, I think in some respects um, he he does it in a way where he's he's free to kind of develop things as he wishes, but he gives us a kind of something that we that we can kind of recognise, but with some scope to sort of not have to be historically accurate. Now that um, is something that for some people really works in his favour. Mm. And I think in, in many cases, the the whole idea of sort of chastising him over not having things historically <laughs> accurate, I think is a little bit of a redundant critique. Well, there's right. dragons. There's the dragons. Story. That's it. I mean, I think, you know, but it's kind of interesting yeah. that, that on the one hand, he talks a lot about this kind of scope to, to reimagine, and, and I completely endorse that. I think that's what fiction should do Mm. um but by the same token when people brought up with him some of the work i've been doing recently has been on this kind of mysterious um continent that you never see in the series you can just see the very very top of it and some of the maps and that's sothorios and um and people have sort of said so you know why don't why isn't sothorios in the show and he sort of says well you know being historically accurate you know people hadn't kind of you know africa wasn't really a kind of a known thing at that at that stage which People have been quick to point out on the one hand, well, historically, actually, a number of the African kingdoms were known, mm. you know, beyond themselves, known to Europeans and known certainly to, to uh, Middle East and to visitors from what we now call the, the Middle East or from the Arab world. Um, and so the Kingdom of Mali, you know, Timbuktu, some of these very kind of yeah. um, well-known medieval kingdoms uh, of Africa were known. So the accuracy thing is maybe even questionable in that respect. Um, But I guess there is always a question that you can ask any kind of author um, or any producer of medievalist texts without sort of having to ping them for not being accurate is, well, what are the kind of stakes of your reimagining? What does it mean to reimagine it in that way? And this isn't me sort of out to condemn 
HBO, Game of Thrones, you know, Martin, anybody for, for this. But there, it is an important question that we have yeah. to ask. Is So when you do imagine the past differently in a way that we can actually measure the difference between what happened then and what you're, dis, you know, reimagining, then the question does become sort of why do you choose to do it that way? Yeah. And that's maybe one of the questions that people have asked also about its kind of sexual politics and that sort of stuff as well, is why... Um, why has he decided, for instance, to kind of move Africa out of the story? Mm. You know? Well, mm. sexual politics and racial politics are two things I want to. I yeah. <laughs> <pick up. laughs> oh, we might we yeah. might start They're with hot. yeah, <laughs> yeah we might start moment. with yeah. race because that yeah. seems to be a conversation that's happening in the kind of public's conversation around the show mm. um, about the, the whiteness of the show yep. and um, the lack of a kind of diverse picture of, of what medieval Europe looked like. Mm. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts on it are, are constantly ongoing and I'm trying to keep up with the conversations which are constantly evolving and really exciting, mm. you know, and, and they're coming from viewers of colour and scholars of colour as well as people, you know, who are kind of committed, um, allies committed to looking at and querying the kind of racial politics of the show. Look, um, I've read a really, you know, I've read some really good accounts recently about, you know, the way in which, say, for instance, Daenerys' storyline has been one of kind of white, sa- you know, the white saviour who comes in and, and you know, frees all the slaves of the East, etc. And I've been thinking a lot about it, and I think, I think you can't argue with that. I think that that's mm. true. I do think, though, that there is a kind of a question, and this is not to disagree with that perspective, but maybe to sort of finesse it or, or, or ask whether there are other aspects that we can consider in here, which is that I actually think her characterisation is becoming more, is becoming darker and darker. So she has, she did play the white saviour, but actually she's done a terrible job in, in many respects. She's come in, she hasn't respected this culture she claims to have freed. She hasn't had any dialogue with the people living there. She hasn't, you know, she's just imposed a particular kind of idea of what she thinks a society should be. And I mean, of course, you, you know, you can't. Um, it's hard not to endorse somebody wanting to to get rid of slavery. Of course, that's a great thing. But also, the way she's done it has been very much a kind. Has been an arrogant um, uh, sort of suspension of rule of law. You know, if you can even talk about that in the Middle Ages. Well, that ties back to what world. you said about her yeah. as a kind of quintessentially kind of medieval woman yeah. because she's just is so fully invested in her power. She's a, yeah, she's completely she completely believes in her right to do this. Mm-hmm. Um and so and that is absolutely driven by this kind of sense of her own kind of cultural mandate. I'm not sure whether at this point I'm still thinking this issue through, but I'm trying to decide whether the kind of increasingly less positive depiction of her is the show mm-hmm. HBO kind of stepping back and saying, well we're portraying this, but she's actually not a character that anybody can continue to sort of celebrate in the way maybe in the earlier seasons she seemed her her sort of passage towards sort of emancipating everybody seemed to be something very kind of positively um, pr- portrayed. But as um, we've gotten to these more recent seasons, I think her characterization is becoming one where she's 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 a Targaryen. She's out to conquer. She's a conqueror, mm. and. I think as that kind of sense of her mandate as conqueror rather than as um, emancipator is developing, I think, well, I've certainly gone off her. <laughs> I've gone off her. I don't know. I can't speak yeah. for all audiences well, here. No, I can I've, only speak for myself. But yeah, I've, I've gone off her too. Uh, and, you know, what you said was actually very true of the last uh, episode, which, you know, we talked about briefly. Uh, no spoilers, earlier. Jimmy. Yeah, yes. no, no, there's not going to be any spoilers. Yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to mention that... Um, yeah, uh, you know, one of her moniker is uh, the breaker of chains. You know, yeah. that, that's how she always introduces right. herself. You know, she yeah. she's the breaker of chains. You know, she's the mother of dragons. You know, she's she's got this long list of all the things that she's accomplished. Yeah. Um, but at the very top of that list is she is the rightful heir to the throne. Yes, um, she doesn't question that. She doesn't challenge that assumption ever. Mm. Um, and and she even makes the argument that you know she by right this is her you know. Um, right to power here mm. but she doesn't question the fact that the history of it was that her people came and conquered Westeros mm. you know mm. they weren't the original inhabitants of Westeros you know they just came and they conquered it and now she has the right to power mm. because they came and conquered mm. it even though her father was mad and you know roasted people alive and everything <laughs> doesn't really matter because she's sane and she's okay and you know mm. and she has a long his- lineage yep. that connects it back to you know this um, uh, sort of imperialist that's it idea. this very very long history of conquest mm. 
Um, and and I think that that's kind of becoming more and more apparent. I mean, she's using the you know the unsullied whom she freed are now and also the Dothraki. She's kind of bringing them into this this hmm. war that doesn't seem to serve them. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. very hard to see how it serves anyone but her. And so. Um, I guess that's the kind of question that's ongoing for me right now, yeah. which is while I think absolutely we need to be acknowledging um, when the racial politics are, are, are tricky and even kind of dodgy, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think we need to kind of step back and say, well, what's happening in the story? And are we being, as as audience members, are we being asked to kind of comply and, and um, accept it or are we being... I encouraged to sort of step back and question. And I just find myself pulling away and pulling away from her. And I was yeah. saying to Jim before that <laughs> my children are far too young to be watching it, but they've been one of them's too young has been what they've been watching. It. And they've really they really dislike her. Mm. And they used to really like her and they just say she's using mm. everybody. So I guess my sense is that I think the show is asking us to really query her sense of mandate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the Dothraki is um, particularly problematic. I mean, I can sort of see the argument with the, the Unsullied. They were slaves, you know, bred, uh, kidnapped and mm. you know, sort of gone through all sorts of torture to, to be the way they were. And she freed them, yeah. so that's a good thing. Yeah. But the Dothraki, the only reason um, they bent her power was because she basically killed all their leaders. Mm. She wiped them all out in one big fire <laughs> that burned <laughs> everybody. Right. And, and now they so follow her. So many fires, I forget yeah. about yeah. you. I forget about which I know. Is so Exactly. You know, so, so she basically uh, wiped out the entire culture, the entire yeah. history, the entire leaders, and now they yeah. do her bidding because they're yeah. terrified of her yeah. in, in a way. Um, but that, for me, is much more problematic, I guess, than, than the Unsullied, which I can sort of see the... Uh, the argument that it could be good, you know, freeing the slaves. Yeah, okay, that's that's a good part, but the Dothraki, that was really, really problematic for yeah. me, and, and that was a, a really good example of you know, how she yeah. does just sort of conquer and then just mm. use, uh, and in fact, you know, again, no spoilers, mm. but it's not really that much of a spoiler. Uh, one of the uh, things that she mentioned in the last episode was that she said, you know, um, uh, one of her accomplishments was to bring the Dothraki across the sea, which no one has ever Nobody's been ever done. able to yeah. do before, yeah. and she's the first one to do yeah. that. And I thought, well, yeah. is that necessarily yeah. to a what good end? thing? <laughs> yeah. To what end? To help yeah. you. And so I think, I mean, one of the critiques made of the show, coming back to your question mm. about race, and I think this is um, one that I'm hoping to see a change in just very beginning of Series 7, beginning to see that this could possibly be, is that uh, there aren't really enough characters of you know, mm. of non non white non white yeah. characters. There are enough um, developed characters of colour. I'm really hoping that um, that the Masande and Grey Worm stories do get developed and their characters do get deepened because I think that they're a potentially really fantastic. I, I keep imagining stories for them. I could see, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of because now we're past, you know, yeah, the yeah, we're novels. We can do what we want yeah. with them. Yeah. And I keep thinking, oh, well, you know, the Mamluks kind of they. They eventually became this really important cast. Come on, Grey Worm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have to stand there. You you are actually free to leave. You know, which is what um, uh, Daenerys always said. You don't have to stay. And I think, well, come on, don't stay. <laughs> you know, maybe there could be the opportunity. I think there is the opportunity now to really develop these characters, and I really hope that we mm. see that and also add to the, that number of characters. And so, you know, because I think that if you are, which this show is taking the Middle Ages outside of that kind of very kind of familiar mm. Anglo-Celtic world of, of fantasy, then, you know, let's see it in the characters. Let's see that kind of developed out. So there is that aspect. So I think that, it, you know, I really hope, I think that there are enough messages travelling toward HBO yeah. and Martin that this is, you know, this is something people would like to see. So I hope, it, you know, I hope the message is, is being heeded. Well, I, th yeah. I think it's sort of co complex or difficult to kind of judge at this point because we're, yeah. we're not we're in the story. We're not at the end of the story. That's so, you know, it, I wonder if that if by the end of the story it'll look yeah or, or be interpreted differently. I think that's I think that that was probably what I was trying to get a little bit in relation to Daenerys because I think that you know I was having those kinds of moments. I remember when she was sort of I think it, maybe she was in can't remember which city now she was in where everybody kind of gathered around her saying you know mother 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 and yeah. they lifted her up and I and it was meant to it, I. It, seemed that it was meant to be this triumphal moment. I'm thinking, oh, really? <laughs> you know, like when I was watching it, yuck. Um, that's a bit, you know, yeah, sort of white supremacist or what have you. Certainly um, it did seem like a white saviour story. But as I say, things are darkening in terms yeah. of the actual um, moral complexity and, and just that sense of her 
her mandate, which has become increasingly hardened. And so, as you say, the, mm. it's it's hard to know whether that moment was deliberately sort of triumphalist and celebratory in order for, you know, f- this longer trajectory to yeah. sort of begin to throw it into question further down the line. So that's, yeah, it is hard to know yeah. when you're in the middle of the story, where is it going to go? And I mean, is she going to be a despot? Mm. That's what I'm wondering. Is mm. she going to be a despot? Or is, is she... she going to unite Westeros as the Henry Tudor figure? And, and, <laughs> and if she does, I mean, and sometimes being united under somebody isn't a good thing See, either. No, no. You know, sometimes <laughs> uniting is a good thing and sometimes yeah. it's a very bad thing. So yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I guess it's just because there is that freedom now to develop it, I guess I would really like to see... I don't wish this on Westeros, but I sort of <laughs> wish this on the show's politics, right, that she, you know, that, this, that her her sense of you know, her right to do this is is increasingly sort of put under pressure. Well, Westeros is used to a bit of violence. I think they'll be all right. (laughs) (laughs) I won't say they're comfortable with it. No, no, no. But they're certainly... Familiar. Familiar familiar with it, yes. Um, Moving on now to the kind of um, the sexual politics of the show. There's been a lot of um, criticism of the show Mm -hmm. in terms of its um, representation of of, um, sexual violence, as well as what is seen by some as gratuitous gratuitous nudity and sex scenes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, what, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like this is a reflection of the medieval world? Uh, <laughs> or is this just, you know, putting some nudity on TV so that people will watch? Oh, <laughs> well, I think... I, OK, so I sort of want to pull the, a few of those things apart and yeah. say that... Um, with the, OK, so I'll do the one that I feel a bit probably have simpler emotions about first, which is the gratuitous nudity, which, yes, mm, I just, yeah. you know... <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's really unequal. Yes. You know, it's really unequal. <laughs> there, there's just, you know, the show does have a pretty bad track record of yeah. lots and lots and lots of female nudity. I mean, it has brothel scenes. There is a narrative rationale, but, you know, you can actually make decisions about representation within that. I think sometimes the kind of willing, you know, the willingness of the prostitutes to just kind of have fun has been a kind <laughs> of a, a, a portrayal that's kind of bugged me a little bit, yeah. you know, well, a lot. And I've sort of thought, oh, that's... Uh, you know, that's not really a portrayal of sex work that, yeah. you know, we, we, we need today. But um, in any case, um, I think that that side of things um, has bothered me a bit. Um, I think there's been less of it, I'll say, without having, you know, looked through all of the episodes um, carefully recently. It does I seem to have diminished a bit. I wonder if that's a reaction to the criticism. I, I think Possibly. It is, I think it's, it is a reaction because in, in, in the last episode, you know, there, there is a, a scene where... You know, there was a, a big controversy about uh, the, the Cersei and um, Jamie Lannister sex scene in, yes. in, a, in the um, uh, what's it, the tomb of um, Joffrey. Yes. Um, and then in the last episode, there was almost a, um, a response to that. And in this one, Cersei takes the lead. Like she's very, very aggressive Ooh, in, in, this <laughs> in this particular sex scene. Spoiler! Yeah, no. Spoiler! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not really that yeah. not much of a spoiler. But, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it is. I think um, they're responding to a lot of uh, criticism. Yeah. Well, that scene was a, a really troubling scene. That was actually one of the scenes. There are some other scenes of sexual violence that I think uh, there is a little bit more complexity around and I'll get to that in just a minute or what I'll talk about is probably the complexity of my emotions in response to it which is probably a truer thing for me for, to talk about than perhaps arbitrating on on um, what other people might feel about it but um, I think that that scene with Cersei which was a kind of a you know no 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 yeah. oh yes kind of <laughs> uh, scene was was a problem I think the the scene I know another scene that that attracted a lot of criticism was um, the scene where Ramsay rapes Sansa on their wedding night, and I know a lot of people were really upset by that. And I, I was upset by you know having to by, by watching that, and mm-hmm. and you know it it was a horrible scene. Um, I think I'm always torn a little bit about these sorts of things from the point of view of what would it mean to not represent sexual violence against women in the show. So that's Mm. the kind of question, the counter question that I find myself asking is, well, what would it mean to not represent it? Because um, if we know that women, not just in the Middle Ages but today, you know, are um, subjected to sexual violence within marriage and within Mm. domestic circumstances and certainly... You know, um, there's been a long religious culture and and secular culture where women's consent was not required Mm. for um, all kinds of, you know, for for production of heirs, for marriage, for sexual relations. Then um, the question for me would be, 
how what would it mean to not ever yeah. include that in the story? So um, while I don't like seeing it, and you know, I sent my children out of the room. I'll just have <laughs> everybody listening know. My don't children be alarmed. Do not watch the, yes. yeah. any of those bits. Uh, but um, you know, I think that. Uh, I do find myself always asking that kind of counter question that we do, uh, you know, uh, if the show is, again, engaging in this kind of intriguing approximation where we do recognise the kind of uh, a world where certain sexual politics apply, then there are grounds for including it. But by the same token, Mm. the show also shows us a lot of um, a lot of sexual diversity as well. Mm. So... um, you know, it gives us, on the one hand, this medieval world where women were chattels and or what have you, or women, you know, um, women's sexual consent was uh, was not a high priority. Um, they were also believed to be highly licentious. Again, there's kinds of contradictions in the Middle Ages around mm. um, women's sexuality, on the one hand, pure, on the other hand, um, you know... Um, the Eve figure. Yeah, the yeah, the, yeah, you know, the kind of, yeah. the, the usual binary, the yeah, binary the usual, we, yeah, we, we yeah. recognise, <laughs> long-standing one. Um, uh, but, yeah, but I think in some respects, I mean, it's got a lot of um, queer characters, mm. you know, Yara, Ilaria San, Loris Tyrell, um, what's his boyfriend, Baratheon? Oh, <laughs> yes. um, oh hang on. Um, it will come to me eventually. Oh, anyway, um, so... You know, they've got a number of, of characters. And also, you know, even um, um, Oberon Martell, he's kind mm-hmm. of a bit pansexual. Mm-hmm. So there is a, a sense in which they do include characters whose sexuality is non-kind of heteronormative. Mm-hmm. And some of those characters, I mean, of course, Loris is badly, badly, badly punished for that mm-hmm. um, by the High Sparrow and the Faith Militant. But um, other characters like Yara actually kind of, you know, they're sort of out and proud, you know, and nobody's <laughs> sort of stopping them from, from um, expressing and living their sexuality. So, yeah, yeah, the show does a really, I just say it does a really uneven job <laughs> of, yeah. of, of that. But I still think, you know, um, we, we always have to kind of ask those questions and it comes back to the question around da- Daenerys as well is trying to kind of get a sense of what sorts of, um, what level of complicity is being asked of us mm. as audience members when we watch the sexual violence are we meant to be horrified by it are we meant to be titillated by it of course that's mm. never something you can completely judge because some people will be titillated by violence mm. you know well that's right uh, incomprehensibly to me but mm. that's the case so i guess um yeah the question of whether the show is asking us to abhor it by representing it mm. or uh, or inviting us to be you know, excited by it is is I didn't think it was in the case of the Sansa scene. Mm. You know, I felt like it was meant to um, to show just how despicable Ramsay yeah. is as a character. And don't forget, he had also inflicted really serious sexual violence on. Um, oh my God! Come on, the guy from Pike. <laughs> I can't believe his name's gone out of my head. You know? Oh yes, um, Theon. Okay. Theon, Theon thank you, Theon Greyjoy, who he, you know, who he castrates, mm. you know, and I mean, it's and not just sexual violence; it's dynastic season. violence as well, because he's ending the line, you know, mm. by doing that. So it isn't, it, but it is, it is a form of sexual violence that he that he inflicts on him as well. And so, um, I wondered. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about the the sexual violence uh, toward the female characters, as there well there there should be discussion about that. But it was kind of interesting that some of the most ex- sort of brutal sexual violence in the show is also directed toward Theon. I'm glad I've remembered his name. <laughs> you remembered his name for me. I can't believe I forgot it. I think it's because I hid in another room when those scenes were on. I actually literally did hmm. go to another room and asked to be called back into the room <laughs> when, well, you know, the when show they were that, finished. The show that this is making me think of is The Tudors, yeah. which is, is such a schlocky, ridiculous yeah. show. But I thought that show was was completely gratuitous. Yes. And, 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 and had no kind of sense of anything besides, you know, we're going to get a lot of very attractive people naked so you can enjoy it, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't feel that Game of Thrones has got to that level. <laughs> I in terms of pure, sheer gratuity and no kind mm. of thinking through of what this means. I mean, I remember there's one scene in The Tudors where Henry VIII picks up a girl on the side of the road and says, I want to have sex with you. And she just sort of says, ah, 
<laughs> I mean, you think, my God, you know. Because he's such a hunk. You know, yeah, like who wouldn't want to Jonathan have Jonathan Rhys-Meyers. Jonathan Rhys-Meyers on the side of the road. But yeah, like it, there, there's no thought in that show, whereas I feel like yeah. Game of Thrones is at least thinking about well, this. Well, thing. well, there is that contradiction, I think, that complexity that you were talking about. In, in uh, I think some of the scenes are very gratuitous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I agree that the sons of rape scene, um, I can't imagine anybody sort of finding that uh, arousing in, in any sort of way. But when you were talking about that, it actually reminded me of another show that I've just recently watched. Uh, which is The Handmaid's Tale. Mm. And there's a rape scene there, which, again, I found very, very repugnant. Yeah. But at the same time, I thought, well, you kind of have to show that in that mm. world to show you know, what kind of horror mm. that these people... You know, It's not a pleasant thing to watch, but at the same time, does it detract from the story? Does it add to the story? And I think it does sort of add to the story. I mean, certainly with the Ramsey thing, he's, he's such a, a hated character. In fact, there's a list going about you know who's... The worst characters are Joffrey or uh, <laughs> Ramsay, and I think Ramsay. Comes oh, Ramsay! Ramsay, <laughs> Ramsay comes out the winner. I've always had a, a hatred for Joffrey for whatever reason. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I can't I stand. I think most him. people do. Yeah. Um, Ramsay, for whatever reason, didn't annoy me so much, but the whole torture of uh, Theon was a little bit too much for me. I think. Do you know? I think the thing about that about Ramsay that always kind of. Um, I suppose, made me not ever fully... I mean, I, he's despicable, he's horrible, but that kind of sense in which the actor was really challenging, uh, really channeling mm. um, a lackey from Clockwork Orange. Oh, he yes. even looks like... Um, he so Malcolm McDowell, the actor yeah, who played yeah, yeah. him, he even sort of resembles him a bit, and I think he may even have studied him a bit in, in yeah, no, um, point, yeah. thinking... I can't remember where I've read there or where I've picked up that little factoid, but I think that he may have in his kind of you know working up of the character of... Of um, the ca- oh, Ramsey. of Ramsey, thank you, the character of Ramsey. So I think he, uh, there was always some part of me that that, that that kind of sense in which he would do those kind of very playfully sadistic things, where you, mm. in spite of yourself, laugh, and then but then five seconds, or one second later, be going oh. <laughs> so, but um, Joffrey was just kind of despicable in that kind of incredibly juvenile way that mm. oh, he was awful. But um, no, I think by definitely Ramsey's bad. But I did hear that Urine Greyjoy is going to make him look like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> so and, I don't and, know what's going to happen. The, I'm scared. The, the, that's, that's the part that I'm not kind of enjoying at the yeah. moment. They, they almost yeah. seem to um, have to be a, a hated character. And first it was um, uh, Joffrey, and then now then it's Ramsey, and then Ramsey's dead. So now they need a re- replacement. And, and lo and behold, here comes Urine Greyjoy, <laughs> you know, back from exile wherever he is. And I'm like, oh, here yeah. we go again. Slate runs a who was the worst person in Westeros. Um, after every episode, yeah. So I think, um, that, and obviously they give it to a different person every week. But I, I, I do, <laughs> we do like the uh, the villain. <laughs> yeah, Euron's beginning yeah. to to you know kind of get a bit of a foothold mm. there in the ranks. So yeah, I, I guess you know in answer to your question, um, I always feel like I, I, I wish I could just sort of come in and say I absolutely you know mm. despise this. And I mean I I think it is important um, though to be constantly. Mm. asking that question and to be constantly looking. Um, I do find the kind of lit scholar in me is still asking those kinds of questions around how are we being positioned yeah. um, as viewers and as readers? Are we being positioned to be complicit? Are we being positioned to um, to reject what we're watching or what we're reading? And so I find I probably find myself asking those mm. questions at the same time as um, as I'm watching and reading these representations. And so maybe that kind of distancing mechanism on my part makes me the wrong person to answer that. And I should be, you know, sort of just uh, sort of coming in and saying, no, these representations are, are, are wrong. And, uh, you know, certainly there are, there, you know, there is the question of, you know, do they, do they cause harm? Do they, do they perpetuate, mm. um, you know, various sorts of, um, power dynamics that are, that are bad ones that our world needs to get rid of. Um, and those are, that's a very, very legitimate question to keep asking. I think, though, as you, you were saying before, um, there is that whole kind of question of narrative trajectory. And sometimes, while we may feel a certain scene was really, really awful, it may turn out that further down the track, mm. there was a kind of a narrative rationale for it. Mm. Yeah. Or a character, you know, there's a kind of a sense in which, you know, a character's, this, this reveals something about a character. And so there are those kinds of literary and kind mm. of narrative mm. um, considerations that go along with it. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the, um, the story comes to mind when you said that uh, for me and, and probably the most complex relationship for me in, in, in this entire series is um, Jamie and Cersei. Mm. Now, because when, when it first started out, you hated Jamie. You, know, you, yeah. you threw Brain off you know, the, out the window and, you know, yeah. 
Uh, he was such yeah. a despicable character. Yeah. And then suddenly, along the way, you start warming up to him, and he's become quite a likable character now, almost mm-hmm. a sympathetic character now, where Cersei doesn't really change all that much. But the complexity of their relationship, you know, she's on the one hand so despicable, but he, on the other hand, is so much more honourable now. And it's it's really odd and very disconcerting yeah. for me. And it almost um, reflects in their children as well. You've got Joffrey, who's just vile, mm. and then you've got the other two... Um, Tom Mice, and Marcella, Marcella and, and, and yeah. Tommen, who are actually quite nice as well. And I thought, I went, well, it's it's a rather complex relationship. Mm. I don't quite know where I stand in this. You know, it's it, it, it's disconcerting, yeah. I guess. Yeah, mm. and I think I think that's one of the, you know coming back to you know one of your very earliest questions: Why is it such a popular show? And I think partly, I mean, even you know, if I as a you know, I would love to talk about its medievalism till the cows <laughs> come home. But mm. you know, there is also that kind of sense that characters that give you or shows that give you. Uh, complex characters that develop and surprise you. Mm. I mean, at the moment, I think Jamie's in limbo. I don't he really is. know what's kind of going on with his characterization yeah. right now. But you'll well, have there's a fan theory which I oh I, is there? I won't yes, so, yeah. I think I've, I've I read think a there's a cottage of industry in fan of, theory. Oh, yeah. believe me, there absolutely <laughs> is. What would YouTube do without it? You know, and I, I do find myself sucked into watching to, to reading them, but or watching them at the moment. I'm I'm trying to dodge because I'm one episode behind, so I, I'm trying to dodge <laughs> too much of it, but. Um, yeah, I think that you know they are characterizations that mm. have um, a kind of they've had a kind of a, a, a longitude to them. You know, they're characters who've been able to develop across a really you know sort of expansive and ever expanding set of series. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of get to see them evolve, or you know, um, yeah, sometimes kind of almost go into hiatus for a while and then come out, you know, as something a little bit different. So I think there's also just um, that as well. You know. Well, I mean, that's a capaciousness of a television show, isn't it? You can you can explore them over mm. many many right. many hours instead of yeah. just the, the two in a in a feature film. Yeah, that's that's really true, and I think also just the the way in which it's a it's just a great portrait um, of the way in which power it, it, it doesn't give you a kind of a story. I mean, you do have stories that are definitely kind of through stories that, you know, say the Daenerys story seems to be this kind of through story that's just becoming mm. ever more relentless and kind of gaining momentum. But there are also lots of kind of haphazard things, characters who you don't think are going to die, die. Um, you know, houses that seem to be the kind of upcoming houses all of a sudden have no heirs anymore. So you, you sort of see the way in which power and the kind of... Um, unexpected um, happenstance that comes with power, you know, comes with having power or wielding power or having power wielded on you um, and at you leaves people, you know, in circumstances they hadn't anticipated. And the other show that I absolutely love in that way is um, although it operates on a different scale um, is House of Cards mm. because, you know, there's that kind of sense in which a new thing happens. So they, you know, they've got this kind of momentum going, this is the kind of campaign, and then something happens, somebody puts, a, you know, a, um, a video up somewhere or, you know, some kind of unexpected event happens and then people have to kind of constantly reconfigure themselves around the unexpected. And I think that that is just, as you say, the TV series allows for all of that kind of stuff to happen across a really, you know, long time frame. And when you talk about it like that, it seems very, very relevant to our times, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it really does. I mean, I think, and I think that's the thing is that where it does have that kind of weird quasi modernity to it, mm. you know, is that kind of sense that rather than as a, you know, I was talking about this with my students yesterday and just saying, you know, the medieval world sometimes has an unfair reputation for stasis, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, certainly this show has not, uh, Game of Thrones has not bought into the um, static Middle Ages. Mm. It's very much the tumultuous um, Middle Ages, particularly, you know, these people who are at the top of the pile in terms of um, worldly power who you know, uh, constantly having to kind of hang on to their power and um, find new ways to, to build their power. And so they are living kind of at the pointy end, as it were, of, of um, change. Mm. I think that's a nice place to leave it for today. We've run completely out of time. Thank you, Louise. That oh, was pleasure. fascinating. Thank mm. you to Jimmy. Oh, pleasure. Um, and uh, once again, I would ask that um, viewers, if you feel so, in- viewers, listeners, if you feel so inclined, um, please rate and review us on iTunes because that'd be really, really useful in helping other people find the show. Um, and please send any feedback or suggestions our way as well. Um, that's it for today. We'll see you again in two weeks. Bye.